So I heard you had a near-death experience where you were dead for over an hour. Oh, can you please share that story with yeah, me? Yeah, in a body bag for uh, right on the dot about 45 minutes, but I was likely dead well over an hour total. So they think I was dead for at least 30 to 45 minutes before they found me. But I was cold, like cold to the touch. Back in the day, I was a, an amateur bodybuilder. I was taking a, a fairly new supplement. Turns out the supplement was toxic and I ended up aspirating in a public bathroom. So I had passed out and started to vomit and I aspirated on that vomit and, and I ended up dying right there on the bathroom floor. And then out of nowhere, I felt like I was sitting in a, in a very comfortable movie chair. And I was watching this movie, but the movie was this scene of this body on the ground. And I was looking at everything from above but what's weird is it didn't feel like it was me at all. Even though I was sitting there looking at my own dead body, I couldn't recognize it. It, it would almost be like going to a movie, like a real movie, and seeing someone dressed like you and looking like you on the movie, but you're like, that's not me because me's over here watching the movie. That's what it felt like. So I, I had no idea that what I was watching was my own death. And a weird thing, is I could actually hear the thoughts of everybody in the restaurant. I could hear every single thought that they had, including even the cook, which was so odd to me. My background actually was TV and film. And so as I was watching this, I thought that was such an odd choice for the director to think that he needed to overplay all these thoughts of everyone in the room. And I just kept thinking, this is, this is a weird movie. I don't know what they're trying to accomplish with this. It's not artistic. It's not this. It's not that. I just, I kept feeling it was very weird. And as that was all happening, I watched them discover the body. And I watched them bag the body. And as they were pulling away from the scene, I could hear this rookie medic sitting in the back of the ambulance. And he was just berating himself. He was saying things like, why didn't you try harder? Why didn't you speak up to these other two veteran medics and say, hey, let's try this. Let's try that. And as he was doing that, I actually saw a light, a real light start glowing from inside this rookie medic. And it, it felt as if like someone put a light bulb inside his shirt, it, like light was actually coming out from his heart space. And out of nowhere, this really strong voice says, this one's not dead. And he heard it, I know he could hear it because he, he paused everything he was thinking about when he heard that. Um, but then a few moments later, I heard him say, that's just your imagination. And, and they, he just shrugged it off. And then for a second time, this light started glowing from him, but it got way brighter. Like his whole upper body was glowing. And this second time, even louder, this voice came forward and said, this one's not dead. And that's when he broke protocol. He unzipped the body bag. He had to undo a bunch of straps. He felt around for a pulse. He didn't feel one. But what he did feel was on the inside femur leg area, he felt like a spark and that was enough for him. Well, he felt justified in trying to resuscitate the body. As I realized they were transferring the body from the ambulance into the hospital. That was the first reckoning that I had that what I was watching was my own death. Because as they were doing all of that, I felt them strapping me. Because they did have to strap the body. It was going into full seizures and, and all sorts of things were projectiling out of the body. And so as they did, I actually felt them strapping my arms where I was sitting. I kept looking down like, what the hell? How come I can't move my arms? And that's when I realized that, that what I've been watching was me. And I looked down to see my arm in the chair I was sitting in. And the, the arm I saw was the arm of the body. And I saw the strap on it. And that's mm -hmm. when I knew that everything I'd just been witnessing was my own death. And that was very freaky. It sent me into this negative spiral where I watched everything negative I ever did. I saw it from my eyes, but also the eyes of anyone I did wrong to. That just pumped me full of fear and self-doubt. And as that was happening, this warmth started to come from behind me and start, start warming me on my back. And, and all of a sudden I could feel like how important I was and I could feel how loved I was. And there was nothing I could do to, to make myself more important or less important. Then I started to see all the good things I ever did.
there was a lot of really good things I had done that I had even forgot about. There was times where I didn't know I was doing good and I was doing COVID. So I got to see that there was far more good than there, there was bad. And I started to feel that I was worth salvaging. And that's when I, I definitely realized that this love was coming from the direction of behind me. So I turned around and I saw this man there, this amazing man, just all dressed in white. And, and the first thought I had was, this is God. And he laughed and he's like, no, I'm not God. I'm just your guide. I'm here to help you go wherever you want to go. And that's when we began our journey. And so he went ahead and, and helped me understand I could go back to my body or I could go up to uh, anywhere in the universe. I felt this, I felt this profound love coming from him. And as I felt that love, I knew that that was something I needed. I knew that was something I really, really wanted. It was something I didn't have in this life. And so I asked him, I'm, I like, where, what's that energy that's coming from you? I want that. And he explained that it was the energy coming from home. And so I proceeded to say, hey, let's go home then. I want to go home. This love that was healing me, and it was healing me, healing me from an entire life of abuse, of trauma. I knew I wanted to go towards whatever that energy was because that energy to me was heaven. My guide, he introduced himself as Drake. He started to, to help me understand that the most important thing for us in this life, the most important thing is authenticity. And that I needed to find out who I was authentically before I could even start this journey towards heaven, towards home. He helped me see that there was a version of me that I would go and be with my mom, dad. There was a version of me that would go be with my friends, a version of me that would go work construction sites or work different TV shows. So I, I knew there was all these different versions of me. And he helped me understand that I could stitch together a core of who I was between all of those situations. And that's who I really was, my authentic self. And he helped me understand that that was the most important self was my authentic self because that's the one that could grow. All the other different aspects of who I was, I couldn't grow because they were false aspects. But the authentic core of who I was, I could develop that core and get it ready for heaven. And that's where we were going. There's divine purpose behind our earth time. The purpose to earth is a classroom and it never was a courtroom, no matter what religion teaches you. It's always been a classroom. You know, in fact, most of the universe refers to Earth as Earth school. And it's one of the hardest schools there is because there is so much resistance, so much hardship here. But it's also one of the schools where you can gain the most. You live a lot harder life here, but you gain so much more than you do in other schools. Love was my third thing I had to learn about and loving everyone specifically that was different for me because I thought that would have been the first and foremost, most important thing. But Drake helped me understand that we can't even feel love, let alone share love until we can be authentic and understand who we are and why we're here. Once I, I put those two together, I could actually love someone else as well as myself. So he helped me understand that our creator loves all of us so much that our creator has left an inner voice it could be called the spirit, could be called intuition, and it could be called gut instinct. And if we want, we can turn it on and we can strengthen that. And one of the ways to do that is to understand our relationship with technology. The technology itself is going to either be lifting you up or tearing you down. And if you're not sure what it's doing, it's tearing you down because it's only one direction or the other. And when it's lifting you up, you know it's lifting you up. So if you don't know what your technology is doing, you, then we know for sure it's tearing you down. Technology is, is just an energy. It's something that can be used for great good or great bad. The difference is, is us, what we allow in our own lives. And I, I personally subscribe to a, something called the hour of power, where I will make sure whatever I'm doing first thing in the morning for 30 minutes and whatever I'm doing last of my day for the last 30 minutes of the day, I call that the hour of power because what we put in that sacred time it becomes who we worship. It becomes who we are as spiritual beings living this physical experience. It starts framing who we are. So it's important for us to really set an intention and set a love to that sacred space. And as we do that, and we put really good stuff in there, we, we start transitioning into a better person, into a great being, into a, 
a life that we want to have, but it puts us in the driver's seat and not like. He helped me understand that, that this midway point of going to heaven, there's a fence in the middle of the midway point and it was called prejudice. And he helped me understand that I couldn't get to heaven until I released all prejudice. And I said, Drake, you're talking to the one guy who has no prejudice in his life. I really believed that at the time. I have two Korean sisters. I felt that I was the least racist. I was the least prejudiced in the whole world. And he lovingly put his arm on my shoulder and he was, he was like, Vinny, I'm so grateful that you don't have any prejudice, but what do you feel about prejudiced people? And when he said that, I was like, well, I'll tell you about prejudiced people. They are so close-minded. They are so ridiculous. I can't believe they, they choose on um, race or religion or lifestyle to, to ostracize and to cut out. I was like, I hate prejudiced people. So that should let me get into heaven. He lovingly showed me I was joining the prejudice team by hating prejudiced people. Then Drake showed me one of the most prejudiced people I knew in my life. He showed me that person's path and that I got to walk a mile in their shoes to, to kind of understand a little bit. I still didn't agree with them in any way, shape or form, but I understood. But I also understood the key to helping them out of that is someone who didn't fit the stereotype. Someone like that who could come up and love that person, that's someone who can heal them of their prejudiced nature. If you can show enough love or pour enough love, on the most prejudice of souls and hearts. You can pull them out of it. You can save them. There's power in creation. And the power of it is our thoughts that we literally create with our thoughts. If we can control our thoughts, we can control our creation. No matter what our life is throwing at us, if we can control our thoughts, we can control the outcome. The next step towards my progress was to understand that if my thoughts could create, how important it would be for me to avoid negative influences. Because if I put negative influences on my thoughts, I'll start thinking negative things. And so I, I need to really seek out positive influences and avoid negative influences in all their forms. Negative influences are entertainment, they're news, they're some friends. There are different apps on our phone that increase drama or increase reactivity to each other. And that was really important for me to understand that as we avoid negative influences, we also understand that evil has a purpose. Without a bad choice, there is no good choice. It's very important that we have the option of evil so that we get to choose. Because if we remove all bad choices, if we remove all evil, there's nothing to be learned. We're here to learn. This is a classroom. My last thing I learned with Drake before I got into heaven was that we're all one. We're not one being, but we are one in unity and purpose and light and in love. And for us to, to hurt or harm another finger on the hand of our creator, it's to hurt only ourselves. That there is not a way to win by cutting off one of your fingers. There's not a way. There is no winning a war. There's no such thing. Everyone loses in the war. By the time I, I finished that last principle or understanding with Drake, I actually touched down in this tremendous place that's heaven. And yes, it's a very real place. I saw the most beautiful hills and mountains, and I could feel the love of our creator from just the grass. The grass itself loved every cell of who I was could feel the individual perception and understanding of each blade of grass. It was life-changing because as I, I, I touched down in this space, I felt a connection. I felt like I was a, a phone on a low battery that was missing a charger. And when I plugged in there, I felt like I was home, like that was my charger. And I could feel just the, the energy exchange that was happening and I could feel the healing that was happening. I got to see the trees and the flowers. I got to see the water. The water was my favorite of all of it. As I, I approached this edge of this little stream, the water asked if I wanted it on me. Of course, I wanted, I wanted the whole experience. Whatever version I could get, I was like, yes, yes, I want this. And so the water darted at my toes and started going over my body. 
but it wasn't making me feel wet whatsoever. It made me feel warm, but also cool. And everywhere that the water touched, I became made whole. I became perfected and I became free of defect from this life, from our, our human life here. And you know, I was raised in a very rough upbringing. So I had a lot of cracks and holes and abuse that needed healing. And I was allowed to receive that healing. And as I was experiencing all of that, my guide Drake, he came up to me and he put his arm around me and he looked at me dead in the eyes. And he said, Vinny, this is going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. And as he said that, I could feel him like reaching into my soul. And he brought me in for this hug. What we do here when we, we have communion or we have sex or we have the, the connection of soul here. All of that is just a mimic of what a hug is like in heaven. And it's way more beautiful than anything you can experience on this earthly plane. And right as we were ending that hug and starting to come apart, I heard this special blessing being given to my body. Now, meanwhile, I was in a coma for three days. And at the end of the third day, my brother was in my hospital room and he was giving my body a special prayer. As he was saying that prayer, I was hearing it live in my ear. I could even see the top of the room. I could see him standing by my body and saying the prayer over the body. I felt the, the tremendous love that my brother who, you know, me and him didn't always see eye to eye. I felt so strongly how much he loved me. I felt the power of that love. And as I felt that power, I felt something pulling me and yanking me from my heaven space where I wanted to stay and forcing me back into my body. And by the time he said, amen, I was forced back into my body. I woke up, I woke up at 1.11 in the morning. I yanked everything off of me. I was extremely claustrophobic. I was ready to check myself out. It took me about six and a half hours of, of doing tests and paperwork with the hospital for them to be okay releasing. That's where my experience takes a, a hard turn because after I had that experience, I was extremely depressed, extremely depressed. I didn't want to be alive. I didn't want to um, be in this earthly plane. I wanted to go back to my home. I didn't want to be here anymore. And I kept hearing Drake tell me on almost a daily basis, Vinny, this is going to be really hard, but it's going to be worth it. And so I stuck it out till I met my wife, Andrea, and she was my saving grace. She was the one who helped me realize that there was heaven here on earth. And in her eyes, I could see heaven. And, you know, I got to learn later. I was at this little town in Wyoming and I saw this history presentation. And I saw my guide come up on the screen and it was just an, an old black and white photo, but it was him. No doubt it was him, but it didn't say his name was Drake. It said his name was Charles, but I recognized the last name and I knew my grandmother was that same last name. So I went directly to her and said, grandmother, who is this Charles guy? And she, her exact response was, oh, you mean great grandpa Drake. He's famous in our family. And, wow. and that was the, that was like the ceiling of all this for me. Yeah. That this was a real experience. It wasn't a delusion. This wasn't my imagination. And I was able to take it and, and do something with it and make a difference for people with it. Is there anything that happened during that experience that you've like, you hold back, you don't usually talk about? Yes, there is actually a lot. So. I saw our future as a society, and it looks way different than we are right now. And it's taken years and years for me to unpack how that transition happens from who we are now to who we become. No matter what the news wants to tell you, no matter what Chicken Little is saying about the sky falling, I want you to know our future is absolutely freaking amazing. Now, not society and humanity in general, but society and humanity that choose the light, they choose to not exist in a cage of fear. Because if you allow fear to cage you, it will. And so, you know, somehow we get out of all these cages of fear 
And when we start building communities all over the world in very special locations, and these special locations build cities of light, and that's our future. I feel that it will be my lifetime that we'll see those cities come together oh, wow. and start forming. And I've seen kind of how that process happens. But the scary part is for most of the world is in the process of getting ready for those cities of light, there's going to be a very big separation between fear and love. And most of the earth is going to choose the fear path and they will jump into those cages of fear for safety, for knowing that they're not going to die. But for me, one of the best gifts is death. To me, the best gift for me is death. And I'm, I'm so excited for when I get to go back. I just pray they don't spit me back out again because I don't want to stay here. I want to stay in heaven. And when I have friends die and when I have loved ones die, I, I feel sad for the survivors, absolutely. But I have jealousy. I have real jealousy. I know where they are. If you know where they are, you want to be there with them, celebrating. What's so great about your, your story, a lot of, I see a lot of people in the comments going, you know, this is a cool experience but like, what's the point? Or like, what can I get out of it? Or how does it help yeah. my life? And you, your experience comes back with just a ton of knowledge. Um, do you have a book? You have a book, right? I do, yeah. So I have a book, we wrote it a couple of years ago. It's giving some people some insight, giving them a higher understanding to why we have difficulties and why we have what we have with this life. They can go to my website. I have a nonprofit, it's called livinggodslight.com. And of course I'm an Amazon Audible too. Hey, thank you for watching. If you want to know what video to watch next, I would suggest this one. This seems like a really good video for you to watch right now. Yeah, that seems like a good one. Oh, you could subscribe. You could do that too. Subscribe or watch this video. Up to you. Bye-bye.